we don't have any money, like we work with resources, we save the food, nobody gets paid, uh, we get uh, fridges donated or whatever we need. But space uh, is the really hard thing uh, because we cannot pay rent or anything. So this is the problem here. Many districts in the Swedish city of Gothenburg are growing fast. In areas such as Marstukskajen, many of the non-profit activities are being replaced by offices, apartments and hotels. Bruno Chies is one of the initiators behind the non-profit Solidarity Fridge that is based on the idea of taking care of food that would otherwise have been wasted. Maria José Zapata Campos does research on the mechanisms behind urban development at the Gothenburg Research Institute at the School of Business, Economics and Law. Now they meet up to talk about what it takes for non-profit forces to not only survive, but flourish in a growing city. Hi, Maria. Hello, Bruno. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Not too bad. Not a bad day in Gothenburg. So I wanted to ask you, you know, since you've been researching this uh, grassroots initiatives uh, in, in the urban context, uh, what have you identified like, as the factors for success, for them to thrive? There are a few factors. The first one is the simplicity of the idea. And I think this is something that we talked about the first time we met, that it is a simple idea that of, often comes from um, um, other settings, like for example when you were in Germany and pick up the idea in, 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 a, in a context where it has been very popular, and it's easy to unpack. And in, and this is one of the reasons why it is successful. And then it is also based on the fact that it, it needs very few resources to be implemented. Exactly, yeah. Actually, um, you make resources out of waste. So this is the, the, the beauty of uh, your, uh, all these kind of grassroots initiatives. You become what we call urban commoners because you make out of uh, something that is wasted through identifying the value that is left in that food, uh, in your case, and other objects, and working, transporting it and distrib distributing it to the people who need it, you, you turn that food waste into an urban common. And those resources are for free. And also the fact that uh, you are doers, you are not interested in talking, um, I mean, this is one of the few occasions in which we could find you doing the talk, the discourse. But instead, you, you guys are always inspired by action. You're not interested in giving discourses about how sustainability should be in all these visions and strategies. You do things. Yeah. And then um, the fourth one, I think, which is also very, it's very exciting to see, is that people, that the people that you recruit, uh, are uh, attractive for different reasons. Yes, exactly. Some of them because of the environmental uh, reasons of um, avoiding preventing food to be wasted, but some others might do it because of material reasons, because they yeah. need that food. Yeah. And that's quite touching when I was uh, looking, uh, observing yeah. some of your activities. You can uh, see how many people need that food that yeah. is wasted otherwise in, in this city, and not the least after the pandemic. But then also for social reasons because you might also find students, um, retirees, uh, that yeah, uh, are there because of the social part, yeah. to meet people. Yeah, uh, I think there's the strongest point about it, like this diversity of people and diversity of interests. Yeah, the only thing you need is uh, uh, space, in many of your cases. Exactly. Yes, yeah, space is the crucial resource uh, that it's not easy for us to find or to be able to pay because we don't have any money. Like we work with resources, we save the food, nobody gets paid. Uh, we get the uh, fridges donated or whatever we need. But space uh, is the really hard thing uh, because we cannot pay rent or anything. So this is the problem here that we had to move from the first place because Studio Fremen, the study organization, lost the financing and then we moved here, paid temporarily um, with uh, money from the city through the study organization. And now what happens is that they are demolishing, tearing down this place 
uh, because of urban de development and uh, we were forced to leave and not just us, uh, Solar Shield, the food sharing initiative, but the bike kitchen as well, which had a quite similar concept, but with bikes. Uh, and finding a place that is central is really hard. Yeah. yeah. And the, what our studies are showing is that uh, for civil society initiatives to flourish, they need space in order to somehow make this creativity grow. And space is a hot commodity these days, as Mastukskain is a part of the so-called River City Gothenburg. This is the largest urban development program in Scandinavia and it will develop residential and commercial space on both sides of the river during the next decades. So, as we walk, we see a lot of construction sites here. Big towers being built, yeah. What do you think of this? Well, um, I'm a little bit ambivalent about this uh, high-end new urban development in the city because uh, it's gonna put a lot of pressure on many what we call cultural institutions in this part of the city, as well as on civil society organizations like you guys. Uh, you will not be able to pay a market rent for these uh, spaces, as there are going to be prices are going to be high. Exactly, and they, they're all, there's so much talk about sustainability and how they value our kind of initiatives that they want to keep us. But then they are somehow forced mm. to develop in this way that we need to pay uh, market prices and uh, that's sort of the core of the problem of the issue institutionally like how the way I see it that uh, the city agencies need to follow these market rules yeah for me the way I see it is also like uh, this place has been attractive among other reasons because organizations like you have been here and they give a lot of character to the city and also it can be used in the in the city's brochures about uh, their visions about sustainability but then when they start building up and you have to, to make a business out of it they kick you off yes. so somehow it's like killing the golden goose because mm -hmm. you're taking away the things that really make part of this city have a local character and at the end of the day, it's also risk because cities become more and more uniform and homogeneous. It's like, you know, that time when the, the London wheel was built up and then every city, including Gothenburg, also had one of those wheels. Mm -hmm. So they become homogeneous. What is the value of it? What is the distinction of the city? Yeah. Yeah. That's from one part. And then the other one is that all the creativity that comes from the grassroots from below for that necessary ecological transition. We lose it. Yeah, I think in other words, what's uh, seen as valuable, these shiny big towers and hotels for some people, is not actually valuable for the people who are living in the cities, even though they try to make the argument that maybe they're creating jobs and stuff like that. Uh, but to me, it's like, a, sounds like a typical, more or less, case of gentrification. Uh. And there is a lot of research showing that there is a high risk of gentrification as it has happened very close to this uh, part of the city as well. But it's also, there, is a, there is one thing that shows research is that, uh, uh, it's a, that when we build up new uh, infrastructures, this uh, facade of uh, modernity, this uh, scale of building up something huge like a high uh, skyscraper, for example, yeah. It is, we just take for granted that that is the solution for the economic development, for the development of the city. We take for granted that that works. Mm -hmm. But could we just instead look into what, what are the local practices that have been developed here and build up upon something that is smaller? Because I do believe that the uh, sm small is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's no content. It's just this big thing and people working and being stressed. What kind of sustainable future do we want when people are doing other kinds of activities and not just uh, cramming into these uh, big buildings and uh, working uh, 10 hours a day? Um, that makes me think about um, what, what are the other examples that we could find elsewhere where uh, these uh, local citizen-driven initiatives for sustainability could uh, keep their place even in central parts of the city. So we've been 
in our studies we've been looking into places like for example Barcelona or Madrid in, in, in Spain where the local government has been facilitating the access to these classes to space that is also in central parts of the city. So this creativity and the, there is social room for non-commercial activities, which at the end of the day, they're also going to have an effect on this. Uh, on so the commercial this. ones, yeah. Exactly. They create value for them and for the neighbor. The problem yeah. here is Gothenburg is that you can even find this kind of openness more outside to other uh, parts of the city, maybe more on the periphery. But uh, maybe we go here. But in the central part of the city is really hard here in Gothenburg. This is why many things we read in the in the literature about the urban development and the social innovation is that one way to go is uh, to is that the city is that the city administration is scaled down. What does it mean? That it becomes closer to the citizens. So very often we can hear the demands even from municipal officers saying, okay guys, you from civil society, come with a solution. But instead, go down to the citizens and say, okay, what do you need? What is the problem that you see? How can we uh, provide with a solution all together? Exactly, mm -hmm. being more in touch with the citizenry. Mm -hmm. I mean, not the least, like uh, in the Gothenburg compared to other settings in Sweden, the civil society here is very strong. Many um, recognize the strength of civil society organizations and you guys, you are very resilient. You're very resilient because that simplicity that we spoke about. So you need very few resources, but you still you need a little bit. So what will be the consequences? How is this urban development going to affect the non-profit organizations and initiatives long term? Yeah. I understand that there are a number of, uh, there's some kind of measures, support from local governments to help you. But yeah. then um, I also understand that that is not the kind of organizations you want to become into because it's exactly. a bureaucratic organization, right? Um, yeah, there might be a problem that because they might say, okay, we have to apply for some funding yeah. and uh, then we have to create an association and then we have to write reports and then we start having a lot of administrative work that we don't care about, we don't want to. Let's and it kills the essence of our uh, organization, or initiative, it's, you it's know? It's killing the golden goose killing again. the golden goose, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's all, we succeed because we have very low barriers of entrance. The simplicity of your the ideas, simplicity. yeah. Yeah, the thing that, you, exactly what you said earlier. Yeah. Then it seems like one of the solutions again is that the local government administrations is scaled down and it gets closer to you and it facilitates, uh, in yeah. this case, a space. They need to provide that somehow and not involve us in the bureaucracy that is necessary for us to like seek funding and pay you know uh, so they actually need to change the, the rules that they're playing with because it's a political question and then to change the rules you have to the politicians need to have a will to do and that. And it has happened before in this city. Yeah. It is possible to change things and to make in, um, more flexible interpretations mm -hmm. of the rules that are set up as well to protect yeah. all the citizens' rights. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You just need to show that uh, we're need, well, we don't need to show anything we show already. They need to perceive <laughs> that uh, our organizations are needed for the city not to die in this uh, void of concrete and shiny glasses. Mm -hmm.